slowing down. Um, hi, everyone. My name is John Freshman, and I am a first year in the biomedical sciences program. And I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Christine um, Owakabizio Donahue today. So, a little background about her. She received her MD, PhD in translational pathology from Boston University and went on to do her residency in anatomical pathology, followed by a fellowship in gastrointestinal pathology, both at Johns Hopkins. She's currently an attending physician in pathology at Memorial Sloan Kettering, as well as the director of the David M. Rubenstein Cancer uh, Center for Pancreatic Cancer Research. In addition, she's also the founder and associate director of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Last Wish Program, which is a rapid research autopsy program that empowers patients at the end of their lives to donate their bodies to research in order to help the research community address fundamental questions in cancer biology, progression, metastasis, and response and resistance to treatment. Her work studies the evolutionary me mechanisms underlying metastasis, focusing on pancreatic cancer as a model tumor. Her lab uses next generation sequencing of primary and metastatic tissues obtained from postmortem donations and aims to better characterize subclonal genetic evolution within primary carcinomas that lead to metastases. Her work has been recognized by numerous awards, including the NCI Outstanding Investigator Award and the Ruth Letts Siegel Award for Excellence in Pancreatic Cancer Research. So we're very excited to have her here to talk today about her work. So thank you very much, and I will pass it off to you at this point. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, as I was telling the students right before this, I'm gonna turn my laser pointer off for one second um, or not, Never mind. Um, I put this talk together, it was based on other talks, but I put it together today to try to introduce some new concepts um, new concepts I am thinking about with respect to my own data. Um, a lot of it is unpublished, and I, um, I honestly like to share unpublished data because I think um, that's what we should do in science, and I always welcome um, new insights, criticism, suggestions, alternative explanations, um, et cetera. So let's, uh, let's jump in. Uh, that's my disclosure. Okay, so um, just to get everybody up to speed on the tumor type, I will be talking about pancreatic ductal lateral carcinoma. This is the most common tumor diagnosed in the pancreas. The peak age of diagnosis is in the seventh decade. And epidemiologic features associated with this tumor type include smoking, chronic pancreatitis, obesity, um, ethnicity, type two diabetes, and there is a role for germline predispositions as well. In terms of statistics, um, the five-year survival rate is 11%, so that's up 1% from uh, last year. Uh, to give you a perspective, when I started my career, I think the survival rate was 4%. So while um, there's much more work to be done to increase this, it has more than doubled, but we really need those numbers to be better. Most patients are diagnosed with advanced stage disease. So um, that means a curative resection for these patients is not possible. And there's many contributing factors that lead to the poor outcome of this disease and why the five-year survival rate is so low. So there's no form of early detection. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a huge area of interest and investigation in both academia and industry. Uh, there are limited therapeutic options. While the, the therapeutic options are, there's a lot of work in this field, very exciting work um, compared to with tumor types such as breast cancer, for example, um, pancreatic cancer really does not have uh, many therapeutic options. And many patients have a poor performance status at diagnosis. And that's, I think sometimes, um, not talked about enough is, you know, these patients are very sick and therefore you need to get them optimized to even receive treatment. And if you can't receive treatment, you can't, you know, really uh, have a possibility to, to beat the disease. The anatomy of the pancreas plays a major role as well. The pancreas is located deep in the belly. Um, you can't feel it. Um, it doesn't cause any uh, pain when there's a tumor in it. Um, 
And uh, as you can see here, it's located right on top of these major vascular structures. And it's even wrapping around right here, the superior mesenteric vein and artery. So um, a small tumor could be actually quite advanced if that tumor is encroaching on these vessels um, and in, and in the circumference of the vessel, if it's more than 180 degrees involvement of it, that's considered a locally advanced tumor. Um, also, some tumors uh, you know, can grow quite big in this area. And in those cases, they can cause some um, signs and symptoms of the disease. So if we take a breakdown of um, 100 representative people who were diagnosed, half of them will be diagnosed with metastatic disease. So right off the bat, they are um, not eligible for surgery and they go right to chemotherapy. 35% of patients have what is called locally advanced pancreatic cancer. So those are the tumors. That's why I pointed out the anatomy that the tumor is not metastatic, but it has, um, it's, it's too large to be safely removed. Um, and then 15% of patients who's left, those are the patients where due to anatomic factors and uh, a number of others, they are able to have surgery while the surgery is not trivial by any means. Um, you know, they are eligible for surgery with, with curative intent. Now, uh, as I said, with these locally advanced and those vessels that I mentioned, some patients, so patients with stage three locally advanced typically get chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Some patients have a great response to that and the tumor will shrink and it will shrink enough that they're considered to be downstaged to earlier stage and they can actually become resectable. So that's, that's great. Um, but unfortunately, most patients who have surgery um, many patients diagnosed with stage three will go on to develop metastases. And then of course the metastatic patients remain metastatic and they develop more burden or increased volume of their disease. So there's, there's been a lot of work um, looking at the genome of pancreatic cancer. This is the TCGA findings. Um, they all essentially show uh, the similar finding, which is that these four genes here are the most commonly altered genes in pancreatic cancer. And in any study, they're always at the top. Um, if you sequence a series of pancreatic cancers and don't see these four at top, you, you have to question um, the quality of your samples or your methodology, or if you have some, by some strange coincidence, a, a unique um, uh, or you know, very unusual cohort of patients. And then there are mutations in these other genes down here. These are real. You see some of them happen at a statistically significantly higher rate than expected, but the rates that those occur are, are below 10%. And you see some of these are known to play a role, but they're on the order of 1%. So this is the genome of pancreatic cancer. Um, much of this is undruggable uh, right now, patients who have BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2 mutations or a DNA damage repair like phenotype. Um, there are strategies for them that we are learning, but um, for the most part, much of this is undrug undruggable. Um, a word about the microenvironment, which just also contributes to why it's such a horrible tumor. There's a desmoplastic stroma. <clears throat> so that means all this fibrous tissue here surrounding the neoplastic glands that you see here. Um, it's poorly vascularized. Here's a blood vessel right here, but compared to the normal pancreas, um, there's fewer blood vessels in a pancreatic tumor, not more. Um, the interstitial pressure is very high um, due to all the extracellular matrix, and it's also an, an immunosuppressed microenvironment. So there's many, many features going along with it. Okay, so let's start getting into some science. So um, I moved to Memorial from Johns Hopkins in January of 2014. Um, yeah, I just celebrated my, my eighth um, anniversary. I didn't celebrate, the day came and passed and I just realized now. Um, 
But I, I came here and that was right around the time that my work was leading me to start thinking of pancreatic cancer, not from a gene centric point of view, but more from a, an evolutionary perspective, um, which led to the writing of this review. Um, I was invited to write this review and I really didn't know what to write about. I was invited to write about genetics and I just said, there's no new genes being identified. I managed to hold the editor off for a year and a half and until I was able to like coalesce my thoughts and put together this, um, this perspective on pancreatic cancer because so many people in the field are working on so many different aspects of pancreatic cancer. I really want to remove the silos and really put it all in, in one perspective. And one of the things I did in association with that, and there'll be some references to this as I go along, is um, I went um, across town, just on the other side of Central Park to the Museum of Natural History because I thought who knows evolution better than um, the scientists there. And um, I started a wonderful collaboration and uh, it's been very fruitful. And many of the ideas that I'll present here have kind of come out of talking with the paleontologists and the systems biologists at the museum. They don't know cancer, but they know evolution. And it turns out everything is, we're all talking about one and the same thing. So, you know, what is evolution? Um, it's a change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations, okay? So if you're talking about dandelions, fish, butterflies, bacteria, people, um, it's all evolutionary biology. It's all the exact same paradigms. And that is why talking with my my collaborators at the museum is so fruitful because they know these paradigms backwards and forwards and have really given me insights into cancer biology um, that I didn't have just on my own working with my data. So cancer is also thought to be an evolutionary process. It is an evolutionary process. So cancer is thought to be, uh, you can think of it as an asexually reproducing quasi species. It has populations of cells that are distinguished by their varying genetic features. It is, uh, those cells are subject to replication or reproduction, if you wanna to refer to it as heritable variation, genetic drift, selective pressures, environmental changes. So some things that are different about cancer compared to a typical uh, biological population is that it's very fast, you know, in biology, and evolution, we think of years or decades or you know millions of years, depending on what we're talking about. Um, but cancer, of course, happens. The, what's happening and the the resistance and the selective pressures are happening over days, weeks, months, and also the number of cells in a cancer are much larger than any um, typical population um, that you might be looking at in a in a. In a evolutionary system, um, there's billions and billions of cells. And the parallels to oncology are that, you know, the, the body of the patient is the microenvironment. Um, the neoplasm is the population. The selective pressures that are imposed on that population are chemotherapy, uh, surgery, um, and then you have resistant cancer cells that form. So those are subpopulations that have special features, okay? So those are all the parallels and the way to think of it. Um, as John mentioned in the beginning, the bread and butter of my lab's approach has been um, to take advantage of the fact that I'm trained as a pathologist. Um, and I've started, uh, I started my career by performing autopsies on patients with pancreatic cancer to obtain tissues of metastases because I really wanted to study genetics in the context of tumor progression and metastasis and nothing really existed to do that um, outside of an approach such as a research autopsy. So essentially uh, with this strategy, this is a, a representative metastasis in the liver, for example. Um, these samples, you can actually get fresh tissue and develop model systems from them. So we've had success making organoids, 
Um, you can flow sword viable cells out of them, whatever kind you want. You can do single cell sequencing. We have largely done single cell nuclear sequencing, um, single cell RNA-seq, um, the, the tissue might not be quite up to par for that, but single nuke works beautifully. Then uh, once that's done, if, if and when we want to do that, these are cut into one centimeter thick slices. Then these slices, each slice is cut into cubes. Each cube is bisected and you see half is formal and fixed and half is snap frozen. So anything that you can do with formal and fixed tissue, you can do here. Um, and anything you can do with snap frozen tissue, you can do. And there's also the option for future banking. What's nice about the system is these two samples are mirror images of each other. So if you make a discovery by histology, you can go to the tube of the frozen tissue to pull it out and study it. Um, if you're sequencing something and you find something interesting, you can go to the histology and see what does that molecular finding of interest, does it look different? And that's the power of the system. So um, with this approach of developing these kinds of samples, we have applied um, next generation sequencing, computational oncology methods. So we do some of this in my lab. Um, if it gets too complicated, it's done in collaboration. And of course, mathematical modeling plays a big role in um, this type of work. And of course, this is all done as a collaborative approach and together, all of this has been um, a very fruitful approach and has allowed us to make some um, interesting observations related to pancreatic cancer. So the, the big point I wanna make here is, um, you know, evolution, it's so interesting and, you know, it's great for cocktail parties and, um, you know, it's very intellectually stimulating, but the bottom line is, and what my grant funding is for is to figure out what are the evolutionary, feature, evolutionary features of pancreatic cancer that are clinically actionable. Because unless it's going to help a patient, um, who cares, right? It, it, we need to do something for patients um, more than um, just sequencing and uh, you know, coming up with evolutionary diagrams. So that is really what I'm going to go into today is um, the work that we're doing in pancreatic cancer in a stage and context specific manner to try and pull out what is most important. Um, there's many things that I won't have a chance to talk about, um, but I wanna at least try to give a concise story here. So we talked about the stage four metastatic patients. Um, the most common patients. And there's always a subset of patients that because they're just too sick um, to be treated or their disease is so aggressive, they just are untreated. So that's, it's a terrible, um, you know, misfortune for these patients, but it does provide an opportunity in science. And that is what is the heterogeneity, the genetic heterogeneity in pancreatic cancer when it is treatment naive. So that means there's no exogenous selective pressure. Um, and you're just seeing what is the baseline. So we've done many autopsies. At the time we were doing this study, though, you really have to be very, very careful with your curation of your samples to make sure you have all disease that is representative of what the patient actually had. So, you know, sampling matters. You have a complete clinical history you know that they did not have another primary tumor in the, in the recent or remote past, a number of things. So we had four patients we studied who all were treatment naive and had metastases uh, to a variety of organs, all standard. This is work done by Alvin McCahon Moore, who was then my graduate student, uh, who came with me to Memorial um, to do his postdoc, and um, I'm, I'm delighted that he has just accepted a position at CDI and will be starting his own lab in May of this year. So in a nutshell, we found um, virtually no genetic heterogeneity. The original title of the paper was no genetic heterogeneity, but the reviewer wanted us to add virtually just to give that, that one, you know, uh, you know, allow for the possibility. And, and I think that's fair. Um, so here are these four cases. There are driver alterations in all four, 
um, but they're all trunkful, okay? They're all located um, in all cells. Um, there is some, you see uh, green and orange corresponds to primary and metastases. We see like they're very short little branches. So any of this heterogeneity genetically was from passenger mutations. And these are not even mutations that would even have remotely any possibility of being a neoantigen. I mean, they're just inert passenger mutations. So essentially a very homogeneous uh, genetic population. By immunohistochemistry, because um, some of these genes were deleted, um, you can't really see a deletion with sequencing, certainly not with bulk tissue. So we confirmed everything at the protein level. And we even went so far, this is one case, this is case PAMO1, what the four samples show, showcase from inside to out. And we found no, um, heterogeneity within any of the four cases at the level of copy number alterations, be it amplifications or deletions of any driver gene. So in essence, no genetic heterogeneity in these patients. That does not mean that there's not epigenetic heterogeneity of which there's quite a lot. Uh, I won't go into that. I'm just sticking to the genetic story here, but that's what we have so far. So how uh, does this occur? Um, there's two possible, I mean, there's three modes of evolution <laughs> described. Um, and I think two of them kind of fit this scenario. So one is either neutral evolution, which means all the driver gene alterations occurred prior to that final clonal expansion, because usually you have mutations and clonal expansions, and then another mutation, and then another expansion. Um, so either that or the driver gene alterations occurred sequentially, but they were followed by a clonal sweep that just purified everything. Um, the data really um, points to, I think, neutral evolution because the number of driver genes on the trunk, um, there's many of them, uh, is actually about four or five per patient you see in this context compared to um, other types that uh, we'll be talking about. Um, and also uh, these patients from a clinical point of view, from the time they presented, their disease was just explosive. So um, we think these are, uh, you know, neutral evolution best explains, I can't absolutely prove it, but, um, you know, with linear evolution, if you do enough sequencing and enough areas and enough subclonal deconvolution, you can pull out these minor populations in the background, which we just did not see um, here. So, um, so let's move now to, um, oh, this should be treated pancreatic cancer, excuse me. I knew there was gonna be an error in here. Um, so genetic heterogeneity in treated pancreatic cancer. So now that we saw treatment naive, and we didn't see any heterogeneity there, we're interested in what's going on in treated pancreatic cancer, advanced stage. So for this, we're looking at um, the locally advanced and metastatic patients, but now who were treated, okay? Um, requirements for inclusion for this study, um, and this work is done by Jung Wei Hong um, in my lab, uh, a postdoc who's now just moved to becoming the um, official computational scientist for the Rubenstein Center for Pancreatic Cancer Research. Um, so requirements for inclusion in this was that these stage three patients, they had to have completed their, their chemo radiation course. We wanted everybody to have completed therapy rather than some completed, some got one cycle of something, whatever. Um, for the stage four patients, they had to have completed at least three cycles of the initial, of the first line chemotherapy. Okay, again, we want to have patients that are kind of representative of, of uh, what happens to these patients. The final sample set was 35 patients, um, 251 um, unique exomes. And these were, um, these were all studied by whole exome. All the data was filtered for the high quality variants. All the high quality variants were annotated for which were in driver genes and uh, which were predicted to be functionally deleterious um, 
We use a pipeline called LIFD, which actually LIFD creates a score of multiple different um, tools for annotating functional, uh, functionally annotating variants in cancer genes. So it's, it's pretty rigorous. Um, I won't go into details of all of that, but just to say that the, the data, when I'm talking about now, it's, you know, we're very confident in the mutations we're talking about. And then again, we had another cohort of untreated patients that really um, serves as a useful comparison, uh, comparator group. So um, the, the data is fascinating. Um, we're finding in these patients, we're going through the data now because it's, it's a large data set. And, and honestly, with these data sets, um, sometimes it just takes time to kind of crunch it and think about it and really pull out what it means. But we're finding that, um, first of all, look at driver genes. You see uh, KRAS is in all patients, it was clonal, right? So you see in this histogram, this is the, the average variance allele frequency. It's, it's just a, a, a snippet, a detail of computational methods that it, it calls a variant allele frequency more than one um, sometimes or, you know, 100%. Um, that's just one of the things that happens. Um, but it was clonal in all the cases. P53 virtually clonal in all. Blue indicates a case that was subclonal. SMAD4, we see mostly clonal, but many cases where SMAD4 is subclonal. Um, CDKN2A, again, mostly clonal, a couple of subclonal examples. Um, interesting, here's some genes that I was talking about in the oncoprints from TCGA that are less common targets, but they're nonetheless important targets that we're trying to understand. And KMT2C, um, in any patient where there was a mutation, is always clonal. ARID1B, with one exception, was always subclonal. So that's very interesting because, you know, it starts to give you a context and how things are forming. If something is forming in a subclonal manner, um, it's more pointing towards some selection pressure occurred that um, allowed for that population to expand. So on the right side, uh, these are called density clouds. And, um, What's very interesting here is this is one density cloud. Um, so it's pairwise comparisons of a, a lymph node met to um, a liver met, but I could show you any two samples. This is one of the treatment naive patients. And you see, this is the clonal fraction that's present at you know one in both samples. It has the KRAS mutation. And that's what um, the clonal fraction looks like. But then there's this population here that is higher than 0.25 for its variant allele frequency. Um, and data based on Christina Curtis and many emails and conversations with her, you know, this is, she counts, I think, at least a variant allele frequency of at least two of a subclone, the median variant allele frequency to be at least two to um, be considered selection um, as opposed to, um, I think actually for strong selection, excuse me. So there is selection occurring in this treatment naive tumor, right? So I said, there's no exogenous pressure, but does not mean that um, there aren't endogenous selective pressures going on. And those could be things related to the microenvironment, the pH, hypoxia, et cetera. So that's very interesting. Here's a stage four treated case. And you see there is no evidence of uh, the chemotherapy this patient received. And they received many cycles um, as really having any selective pressure or influence, at least in the form of this density cloud. Here's a stage three patient where there is some selection and it's weak. And with exception of one or two patients, um, I don't recall necessarily if they were stage three or stage four, we're not seeing any evidence that the treatments being used for locally advanced or stage four in this cohort have any strong selection uh, it's, or it's not causing any strong bottleneck in any way, I guess is what I would say. And I think that's important because, you know, when we're treating tumors, really what you're trying to do 
is cause an extinction event, right? Um, bottlenecks happen and the, the more strict the bottleneck, the fewer of the population get through. And, you know, when you have an extinction event, the population that remains after that bottleneck, if they can't survive, then extinction happens. If they're able to repopulate, then, you know, that would be um, uh, selection. And we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that. Um, so this, this sort of tells me that the bottlenecks that are being caused by these treatments are not very strict, right? Rather than like the neck of a Coke bottle, it's sort of like the opening of a bucket. I would sort of imagine like that. Now, this is what strong selection looks like, okay? It's another case that's coming up that I'll tell you about. So we certainly see cases that have strong selection. Um, but we are not seeing it in the stage three and four. And I think this is an example of how using evolutionary information can give insight into our treatments. Now, remember I said pancreatic cancer does not have many treatments and it does not have any targeted therapies, um, certainly not that are used in a selected setting. Um, cisplatin is not really in, in the setting of DNA damage repair. It's not really a targeted therapy. Um, it has some nuances to itself. So in the setting of a targeted therapy, I would expect in, in the appropriate genetic context, uh, appropriate mutation, I would expect that there, you would see strong selection, but we don't see that. We would certainly test that, um, that hypothesis in you know, lung tumors or something like that, that has a mutation that's targetable, but this is what we're seeing you know, right now. What we're also seeing in these cases is um, additional evidence of subclonal evolution, um, particularly with respect to the TGF beta pathway. And um, this pathway is, you know, very important for pancreatic cancer. And, uh, you know, it was more than a year ago, right? It was first year of the pandemic and I was asked to give a talk and um, putting it together. And I said to Jung Wei, could you just give me an uncle print of something? I just need to show something. And he, you know, sent this to me and I, I was fascinated because we have SMAD4 here that's inactivated, right? We know that happens, but we also see TGF beta R2. And TGF beta R2 is just in the locally advanced cases. Um, there's a case here of stage four where you have SMAD4 and TGF beta in the same tumor and they happen to be mutually exclusive. So that was very, very interesting to me um, when I immediately, and here also, here's an example of SMAD4 that's in a single sample of this treatment naive tumor, right? So you can have subclonal evolution occurring, but it's not because of treatment. Um, it's being selected for by something else. So uh, let's look at this a little closer, this particular patient. And these are the samples. They were from the primary liver metastases or peritoneal metastases. And six of the samples have a SMAT4 mutation and one of them had a TGF-beta R2 inactivating mutation. Um, when we went and looked at these, the histology, the phenotype of the TGF beta R2 was more well differentiated than the phenotype in these regions, which was more poorly differentiated. So that was very interesting. And it shows that not only um, are these mutually exclusive, but they can even be mutually exclusive in the same person. We went as far as looking at this now by single cell sequencing, DNA sequencing, and I have found even at the level of individual cells, they're mutually exclusive. So um, that is um, a story that is, um, I'll, I'll let you know, that's very uh, interesting to me. So let me just put this into context. SMAD4 right here, it's also known as a, a co-SMAD. And that is because um, it does not bind DNA itself, but when a receptor SMAD, such so as SMAD two or three is phosphorylated, and that phosphorylation occurs because the receptors, uh, type one and type two receptors at the membrane, once ligand binds them, they become phosphorylated. Oh, oh my goodness. What is that? Uh, hang on one sec, folks. That is the most bizarre thing. Hang on one sec. I'm gonna stop sharing and fix that. That 
All right. Can everybody see? I need somebody to unmute and let me know. Right now, we just see you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the um, when the receptor SMAD is phosphorylated, it binds with SMAD4. They go into the nucleus and they activate gene transcription. Sorry, we but, can't see your screen. Just just your face right now. Oh, ugh, that's that's the worst part. <laughs> Sorry, people. Um, that's all right. I'm back here. I'm going to start sharing again. Um, and now I'm going to do presentation mode. How is that? Uh, it's, it looks good. We're back. Okay, good. All right. Apologies. Uh, yes, TGF beta pathway. So you can either have SMAD4 or mutually exclusive. You can have inactivation of the type 2 um, receptor. So what does this mean? What are we thinking? What am I thinking right now in terms of what are the types of evolution going on in these settings, right? So in theory, any of the three can be happening, but um, I believe what we're seeing is probably more on the order of branched and linear, okay? So branch certainly in the case of the mutually exclusive mutations in the TGF beta pathway, um, but in cases where we don't see that, I can't rule out that there isn't some linear evolution going on as well. Um, so this is giving us a little bit of a context of what I think is going on here, okay? Now, I wanna go back to 2009, to an observation I made in the first paper I published based on the autopsy series. Um, when I went back to 2009 to see what was newsworthy that year, just to give us all some context, that was a year that H1N1 was declared a, uh, a pandemic, a potential pandemic. Um, so uh, just a, a curiosity at, at how things have changed. But what this paper was looking at was the patterns of failure in patients that have pancreatic cancer at autopsy, if they had a lot of metastases or if they had no metastases and the genetic status of these three driver genes. These two, um, KRAS was studied by Sanger sequencing. We're even doing next gen then, P53 and DBC4 or SMAT4 were done by Sanger sequencing and immunohistochemistry. Actually, I think DBC4 was just immunohistochemistry. And we essentially found that there was a statistically significant relationship between SMAD4 and the pattern of failure in that patients who had a lot of metastatic disease had an activation, had loss of protein expression, excuse me, had loss of protein expression. Patients who did not have a lot of metastatic disease and had these more locally destructive, bulky, primary tumors and they died of, you know, the primary tumor growing into some critical structure, they were um, less likely to have SMAD4 inactivation. Okay. And this is an example of what the immunostain looks like. The immunostain is very nice, a nice antibody. So this is a, home, a case that has a homozygous deletion. You see, there's no staining there. And these are positive. Um, this is a normal duct right here. These are acinar um, glands that look like they've, they've involuted. Um, you have, uh, but there's some random single cancer cells here. This one right there that if you didn't know, you would maybe think it's a lymphocyte. <clears throat> so the stain's very nice. Um, so this led to people, uh, this led to a lot of excitement in the radiation oncology community um, because their interest is in controlling local spread and patients with locally advanced tumor, if you can achieve local control and they don't develop metastases, that's potentially a, a cure. Um, so there's a lot of interest in exploring SMAT4 and it just is not a good biomarker for um, pattern of failure or response in these settings, right? Some people found there was a relationship, that's great. Um, others did not find any relationship at all. Now, uh, there are many reasons for, for this. Um, you know, uh, immunostaining is not a clear proof test. So there's a lot of variation in how people interpret it um, in different institutions. Like I said, lack of consistency in interpretation, uh, you know, I think some of these are looking at resected 
Some of these are looking at, uh, like they might be all receptive. No, this one is locally advanced. So they're not even looking at the same population sets. They're all retrospective. Um, some um, mutant forms of SNAP4 are actually expressed. So that would be an example of a, uh, an incorrect, you know, characterization of the tumor. So there's many reasons why it just did not work. <clears throat> and that's why the data that I showed you about the convergent evolution for the TGF beta pathway, I'm very excited about because, you know, it makes me excited again about that concept and the stage three patients. So should we revisit the TGF beta pathway? My answer is yes. Um, so we should move beyond SMAD4 because SMAD4 is not the only part of the story. Um, we need to develop assays that more accurately interrogate the entire pathway and whether those assays include just uh, the genetics of the pathway or if there should be something else involved, we need to see. It brings back the idea, is there a role for targeted agents to the TGF beta pathway? There are biologics, but um, I, don't, I don't believe that they have really great results and you know perhaps the sad tumors are just not stratified correctly so this is something I'm very interested in moving forward um, certainly interested in looking at this in the context of chemo radiation um, clinical trials of patients with stage three cancer you know trials of patients who um, you know is this a marker of who will be downstage or who will not I don't know um, but what's also very interesting is remember as I said we're seeing, and some of these patients, you know, evidence for selection, but the selection does not have any relationship to how they were treated, the extent that they were treated, um, if there was radiation or chemotherapy, et cetera. So it points to the selective pressure being endogenous. And I, I predict that that selective pressure is the stroma. Stroma is very rich in TGF beta ligand. I think it makes perfect sense that you have a lot of TGF beta ligand, a survival mechanism of the neoplastic cells is let's just inactivate the pathway and remove those growth inhibitory signals. And that's where we are with that right now. Um, so let me tell you now, so we're kind of going backwards, but um, I thought it made, um, it was a little easier to kind of explain the story this way. So what happens in recurrent pancreatic cancer? Okay, so patients who have surgery, um, they're anastomosed. We picked all patients for the study that completed their adjuvant treatment. Okay, again, that was important. And then they all had autopsies and we collected the local recurrence and or the metastatic disease uh, wherever it was. So the primary tumor, which is a treatment naive sample. So this is both multi-region and temporal sampling in this example. The primary tumor from resection is always called PT1 and the remaining samples are PT2 to PT11, depending on how many samples they had. So the story here is that uh, we see a lot of subclonal heterogeneity, okay? And um, these are the mutations or genetic events that are clonal in these 10 patients, right? So here's our big four. Um, now, of course, I put SMAD4 at the top, but um, really these, um, these are the ones that we see here that we expect. And then these are the variations that we found that were subclonal. So that means they range anywhere from being in a single sample of the recurrent disease or um, a subset of the samples of recurrent disease or the primary sample and some samples are recurrent disease. They just were not in every sample. Any variant that was in every single sample for that patient is up here. So these are the example of the things that are being targeted, um, not targeted, that are enriched for within recurrent disease, okay? And this again, um, I showed you some of these before. So th this is evidence of very strong selective pressure, strong selection, I would say, strong clonal selection in patients um, in the recurrent disease. I think that makes sense because in between the primary tumor and the recurrent disease, there was surgery, right? And then uh, the disseminated disease, whatever is there, grows back. And so it makes perfect sense that you would see 
evidence of a lot of um, clonal selection. So we looked a little closer because um, you know one one question is does treatment cause these findings or are these uh, variants pre-existent? And the answer is they're pre-existent. Um, the answer is in the title, so I couldn't um, I couldn't fool you with that. But um, when we look at these, and we looked at these specifically, we looked at many examples, but I'm showing these because in theory, you know, um, this AKT1 mutation, this PIK3CA mutation, these are mutations that um, are known hotspots and that are actionable. Um, so they're basically, they're all pre-existent at the time of surgery. They're in that primary tumor that was treatment naive. I can't say in this example, if they're in the same cell, um, or different cells, but I suspect it's the same cell just because these um, uh, allelic percentages, this is digital PCR, by the way, um, are the same in the primary and then this particular recurrence. So I, I um, suspect they're in the same. And then this one here, you see it was in the primary tumor. It was only in one metastasis at recurrence. So um, not every variant that's pre-existent will necessarily lead to recurrence in all sites. Okay, I told you we're gonna be jumping back and forth with um, evolution uh, factoid. So um, this is one of the things I learned at uh, talking with my friends in the museum, Mark and Ward. Um, so I was telling them about our data and they said, whenever you see a really big change it means that the environment changed. So don't look to the tumor cells to, for the explanation. They said, look to the environment. You know, and they said, does that make any sense? Is that something that could happen in cancer? And I said, yeah, that actually makes perfect sense. So this is their point of view, right? So Mark Norell is a paleontologist um, who is interested in extinction events. Um, so, right, this is 65 million years ago. Here's the dinosaurs, here's the meteor comes and hits off of Chicxulub. Um, uh, it took 5 million years for the dinosaurs to die out because essentially, you know, the sun was blocked, there was collapse of the food chain. So the apex predators died. And Jeremiah sinensis is the common ancestor of all mammals. This is a nocturnal, was a nocturnal animal uh, about the size of a rat, kind of looks like a rat, um, that was then able to come out of the trees and flourish and give rise to all of mammals. So that's an example of exaptation. This is a pre-existing uh, variant. So that's kind of what's happening. What we're seeing with the recurrent disease is that the variants are pre-existent, and once the um, you know environment changes in a way, the recurrent disease that we're seeing, we're getting a sense of the genetic features that are, you know, most able to survive in that. So there's a lot of conjecture in that, but we want to get at this a little closer. I'm almost done, so we should be on time. Um, in that prior study, when we looked at the primary tumor, we're looking at one piece, right? So this, um, in this example, Caitlin McIntyre, um, a postdoc slash surgery fellow um, at Memorial, uh, we looked at a series of resected pancreas cancers, but this time we did multi-region of the primary treatment IE tumor itself, okay? Um, so we had to come up with a way to, you know, be very systematic about our sampling because we really wanted all the sampling to be the same distance from each other across every patient. And, you know, Caitlin's solution was to get this um, cookie sheet from Bed Bath & Beyond for $5 and it works like a charm. It's perfect. So we always put it on top of the tumor and you can just literally select with um, ink um, the same squares every time. So each one is 0.5 cm on a side. So it's, it's perfect. So this is what we're seeing um, in the resectable disease, a lot of subclonal heterogeneity. Um, I mean, it's, it's obvious and, um, you know, in, in your face. So this is one example, the same example I just showed, there's a common KRAS mutation in all of these. This sample did not have any uh, mutations, probably because um, it's more chronic pancreatitis and it's at the periphery. So it probably was just um, 
grossly it might have looked and felt like firm tumor, but it just wasn't. And that's what happens. But um, that's why this one dropped out. Um, we'll come back to that in a sec. And then here we have a mutation in sample P3 alone that is uh, private, this DNMT3A. And because we know the sizes of these, you start to get a sense of how big a, a subclone is. And so this really looks more like, in all of these cases, we're looking at branched evolution. So, you know, we're really starting out in pancreas cancer, when you think about it, you know, it starts out branched evolution. Um, again, remember this is treatment naive and we're seeing these changes. So this is not therapy causing this. This is not surgery causing this because surgery is not going to make different mutations occur, you know, within a few hours of the procedure. So things start out as branched, clones start competing and overtaking and you eventually end up with a homogeneous neoplasm. That is how, we are now seeing the spectrum of pancreatic cancers, okay? So resectable pancreas cancer, you know, lethal subclones exist at diagnosis and surgical resection. There is heterogeneity for driver genes of these subclonal events in resectable disease. So now what we need to do is catalog all of the subclonal events to see which of those are the most likely to be clonal versus subclonal. Really, this is like going and taking, catching all of the Jeremiah sinensis animals and, you know, getting a bunch of them and then characterizing the animals, you know, what, what are their features that are, are unique to an animal versus common to all of them. So are there common genes or pathways associated with treatment resistance? One of the things I'm not showing, but we did find um, in the previous study that I showed you of the recurrent disease, we know, and, and from many people in the literature, KRAS um, activation by copy number gains or um, allelic imbalance or amplification, that is certainly a mechanism um, by which resistance can occur. But we want to see what are the other things that are happening. Okay, so to put it all together, like I, I kind of said, um, I covered a lot of territory here, but um, you know, I, I really want to give the perspective, as I said, that you know, evolution's interesting, but we really want to find what is actionable about it. We want to understand um, you know, what is important about it. And and I'll just say from my own perspective and thinking about cancer this way, I also in any talk I go to in any subject, um, but really when I never go to any kind of cancer talk and I'm listening to the person speak, I'm always thinking, how can I categorize their data that they're talking about? Are they talking about a cell intrinsic feature? Are they talking about a selective pressure? Are they talking about um, you know, a, a bottleneck or anything like that? And uh, it's been fun and I hope that I've been able to give you a new perspective on pancreatic cancer. Uh, here are my um, incredible lab members, uh, very dedicated and wonderful people and my funding. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. I here for the talk, this was really interesting. Appreciate it. Um, I don't have any questions currently in the Q&A, but if people do have questions, feel free to, okay, now we have one. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, first, uh, Dr. Gutkin, if you wanna turn your camera on and ask, or I can just ask a question for you. Okay, well, he, he asked a uh, wonderful question. He said, question about IPMN evolution. Uh -huh. I don't know if uh, there's a more uh, to elaborate on that. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank, thank you. Amazing talk. So that's thank you. Really wonderful. So I have a question about IPMN evolution. Yeah. So in IPMN, quite often they have GNAS mutations, very, very, very frequent. Yeah. I think that you were perhaps you were involved already in this in, in Hopkins. And then few of them, but by the fraction of them, will evolve into pancreatic adenocarcinomas. And when you show in, in, in your data set, uh, so gene is mutated in 8%, more or less. Right. So do you have any, so the transition from the, shall I say, the pathway from IPMN to pancreatic adenocarcinoma right. versus 
I mean, appearing without a, a, this type of pre-malignancy. Do you know anything about so, that? Um, so a lot of that data, um, right, it was done at Hopkins. Um, Laura Wood has done a lot of that work as well. Um, my, my, the, the only thing that I have noticed thus far in my data, uh, there was one case that was uh, shown in one of my slides. It was um, one of the patients that I showed that had the KRAS mutation in the recurrent disease and that patient's initial mutation was a GNAS. So KRAS, you know, seems to be um, activated to allow for the progression. Now, if that holds true for IPMNs, um, I don't know. I have tried, I mean, honestly, in the world of academics to a little bit stay away from IPMN so as to not infringe on Laura's niche, because Laura was also my former fellow. And, you know, I don't want to get in her way. But um, yeah, it's a fascinating question because IPMNs, you know, you have this exuberant uh, pre invasive process. And, uh, uh, you know, which is opposite of PDAC. So I, I don't really, I don't really have a good answer for you, but um, in my own data, I see oftentimes when there's GNAS is also KRAS and they're not necessarily in the same cell. I can tell you that. So in, in general, in IPMN, but in general, in other cancers as well, uh, RAS in, for colon cancer as well, a RAS in, in, in appendix cancer, so that's very right. easy, 50%. RAS in, in GNAS are both mutated, and you right. know that you require both at the same time. Right. So what is exciting is for your evolution, it's yeah. almost ideal to start from a pre-malignant condition, even if it's not the most right. compelling. So that, that would be ideal if you have any of your um, uh, others resectable yeah. or a post-treatment. So they have evolved from IPMN and you have access to the IPMN that can be for uh, ideal. There's to many cases I have that have, you know, they're, they're just a cancer that was at autopsy, but there's GNAS mutations, there's RNF43. So I suspect they arose in a cystic precursor that was not recognized, which does give us uh, an opportunity. So buried in the data that's, unpublished right now that that's all in there and I will try to be sure to pull out that story um, if there is one there um, because I I think that is that is important yeah it'll be it's an alternative way to kind of see what makes the IPMNs progress okay happy to help you model that in mice I appreciate it thank you thank you we have a, another question uh, from Diego uh, he asks is there a way to predict which subclonal populations will end up being most fit slash homogenous in a given patient? Um, that, yeah, that's the entire point right now of, um, of looking at the multi-region sampled resected tumors. Um, what, we're, what we also have going on right now is we're doing a very, very intensive single cell DNA sequencing um, study of pancreatic cancer. So it's multi-region uh, primaries and metastases. So we want to see all of the lineages that exist and which ones might be abortive and which ones, you know, usually the only ones that you see if you're doing whole exome are the ones that won the competition. So we want to see who are the losers that are kind of in the background. Um, and certainly that in combination with some studies we're doing, um, some collaborations we're doing with digital pathology um, and um, spatial transcriptomics to try to get a sense in an unbiased way or what are the features of the microenvironment that might select for those. And I mean, then we would have to model that. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, you know we have a lot of exciting ideas to move forward on on how to do these things. But the ultimate goal, you know, if you know what the features are of the subclone that's going to be the lethal one and the problematic one, you can do something about it early. Um, sorry, Ron. Just before you, there was someone else. Uh, one other question in the Q and A. Um, someone asked, "Are you uh, interested in drug discovery?" area in your research besides genetic aspects? Um, drug discovery, we, we have a project going on. Again, it started as an evolution side project that has led us to 
you know, wander um, into the drug development space. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> you can tell by my answer, my body language, it's clearly not my comfort zone. Um, but yeah, I'm open to anything if it's going to solve an answer and, and address a question. I think for TGF beta and the TGF beta, you know, um, targeted agents, I, I'd be really interested in exploring those and how to use them. I think it's just so complicated because, you know, uh, the, the cell is mutants, but it might be the stroma that's driving everything. So are you targeting the stroma? Are you targeting the cell? And I'll just tell you, like on some, we have lots of unpublished data. Um, in data where we've taken mouse models and ablated the stroma, the rate of metastasis just completely goes down. If you even treat the mice with something like Tris buffer, we're able to get that through the um, IOCOC. Um, you you put you make their water more you know basic. Try to change the pH of the animal, and the metastasis goes down. It seems like compared to animals with regular pH water. I mean that that's out there, but we're trying to just really think outside the box. How do you change the microenvironment to just change the behavior of the tumor? Great. Okay, Ron, you can go ahead and ask your question. Well, that's kind of the area that Hi, I was. Ron. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> talk. And it was. I would know, have worked a little harder at my answer on the stroma uh, if I knew you were that, there. That, 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 I mean, that's the area that I was really uh, picking up on because obviously it's a very dynamic and multi component entity. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the fibroblast compartment uh, right. is rather aggressive <laughs> and uh and it's 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 got its own diversity yeah uh, in it as well so there's at least four different types of of fibroblast derivatives that are doing different things right uh, but i guess the question is uh in sort of sectoring out the microenvironment um you could go in di different directions yeah. uh in trying to target individual these components, uh, you know, we've spent a lot on trying to target the fibroblasts right. um, because they're such prodigious producers <laughs> of both nutrients, metabolites, uh, and cytokines. Right. Um, and uh, but I, I I think that um, your your analysis was very good. Um, and I'd have to look at it a, a little bit more to try to deconstruct if there if there's any other points of entry that could actually be targets of therapeutic interventions? Yeah. A lot of our therapeutic intervention, you might call soft therapy because we're trying to reprogram like with paracalcitol. Right. Not, not a, a cytotoxic drug. It's, a, it's, it's, it's activating a resolution program. That right. Normally happens when those cells are in wound healing and the wound healing's over and they, they become quiescent again, which is a natural process, but when there's a tumor, they don't yeah. become quiescent. So we're just trying to recapitulate that state. Right. Um, but there might be other components in the way you're breaking it down because you have some new ways of doing the computation uh, that could open up new directions. So I was yeah. really intrigued by some of the newer ways that you're breaking it down. And uh, saw a few different, different uh, networks in there that, that might be of interest to combine uh, with the sort of things that uh, we'd be doing, which are resolution. We mostly work on promoting resolution as opposed to targeting and uh, sort of killing cells. And so yeah, there, there I, these combinations I was thinking from the, the way that which you approach uh, and the way that others might approach it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would love to talk more offline too to figure out how to do this, but, you know, treating the stroma one way, you just change the tumor to a different way. The tumor is poised to adapt and do anything, right? Um, so, you know, thinking about from the most, you know, starting with the most simple kind of competition experiments, if you take cells with the two different genotypes and co-culture with a certain kind of fibroblast and, you know, which wins the competition or which is, you know, 
uh, has a selective advantage to grow in that context. I mean, it could be as simple as just doing co-culture of two populations with one cytokine or something. It's so complicated, it has to be teased out. Um, uh, but it, it, does, it does drift a bit into an area that is not my expertise or comfort, which is, you know, how to treat and 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 all those things um but i i really i really in my gut i just think it's really important and it it adds to everything that everybody else is doing about the stroma and the tumor and i think it's it's an exciting avenue that i, I hope all of us can kind of put our heads together and work on i think there's something there yeah thank you. i don't know if that would get me grant funding to say i think something's there but i could try Thanks. It looks like we have uh, one more question in the chat here. Um, Dr. Yang, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah. Hi, Christine. Such Hi. A, such an interesting talk. So just follow up with the TGA beta question, signaling question. In those lesions that lose TGA beta receptor or SMAT4, is the TGA beta signaling really off or this is just a switch to a different uh, That's receptor? a great question. That's exactly... Um, you know, I've, I've gone the genetic route. Um, yeah. I need to, um, I, I need to do exactly that. Um, okay. I'm, I kind of foresee, you know, the paper with all this data to get out the genetic one, but really, yeah. um, to look at the function of the pathway, yeah. right? One of the things I, I didn't even show yeah. is, you know, we have data that in the tumors that inactivate the TGF beta R2 receptor, are the same tumors that inactivate activin receptors. Yeah. So I almost imagine that pancreatic cancers can be sub segregated into the SMAD4 deficient, yeah. Yeah. right? So canonical signaling to the receptor deficient. Yeah. So per, you know, uh, changing the, the interaction with the microenvironment, yeah. then there's the ones that are completely wild type. Now, if there's some, you know, transcriptional thing going on, I can't say, but um, yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right. What would you recommend any kind of simple way to start to try to interrogate that? Because once it starts getting into like, you know, cell culture and stuff, then that's, that's moving. I do cell culture, but you know, it's getting farther and farther away from uh, yeah. So, so, so because you have those tumor samples, you could look for TGA beta responsive gene expression yeah. coupled yes. with your mutation analysis. Yes, right. That yes. could be the first yeah. step. Really okay, good. I, I was thinking yeah. that, but I thought you know, oh, I uh, that's that's great to know. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have any more questions? Maybe we can fit one more in, but there's nothing else posted in the chat right now. Or somebody can shoot me an email. Great, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the talk. It was, it was really informative and uh, I, I certainly learned a lot more. All right, thank you everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, Christine.